beginning at verse number 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps, went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Father, we ask you to to bless the reading of your word. And I pray that you will help us this morning to convey what we feel you have placed upon our hearts. May nothing more, nothing less be stated than what would be pleasing in your sight, we pray. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I call your attention to the first word in this verse of Verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Then, and if you read the, uh, the scriptures prior to Matthew 25 uh, in verse, chapter 24, you will read about the coming of the Lord and end time events. And when he says then, what he is saying is this. When Christ returns for us, the rapture of the church, here's what it will look like. Five five wise virgins, five foolish virgins. That's what it will look like. We have made the statement several times in the last month or so that uh, that there's good and bad growing together in the church. But at some point, there will be a separation. And this is that point when Christ returns. Then, this is what he will discover. Those who are truly wise are really foolish, are so as... It relates to their souls. A wise person gives great attention to their spiritual life and to the condition of their souls. Matthew Henry says, Many have a lamp of profession in their hands, but have not in their hearts sound knowledge and settled resolution which are needed to carry them through the services and trials of the present state. Their hearts are not stored with holy dispositions by the new creating spirit of God. Our light must shine before men in good works. But this is not likely to be long done unless there is a fixed, active principle in the heart of faith in Christ and love to God and our brethren. And I say amen to those words. I believe that. Here's what you can take away from this message this morning. No oil, no fire. No oil, no light. No oil, no fire. And fire here represents, in the eyes of different people, different things. But that be as it may, we know oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
and that when the Holy Spirit comes in our life, a fire is ignited within us that begins to burn. But no oil, no fire. The fire goes out. A young lady, I think she was relatively young, seemed to be, was sort of in a stupor, dream state. And she was mulling over in her mind this question. What would my life be like without the indwelling Holy Spirit? And she penned these words in her blog. I would be operating totally on my own resources. Listen carefully, that's true. I would have no assurance of my salvation. I would have no presence of Christ living inside of me. The Spirit would not be indwelling me. I would have no internal conviction of sin. I would have to transform myself into the image of Christ. I could not understand the scriptures. I would have no guide. I would not know truth. I would have no internal comforter, nor intercessor, nor counselor. I would be totally on my own. My own efforts would be all I had, nothing else. I would have no power, no internal equipment, nor effectiveness in telling someone else about the risen Christ. I would be on my own to convict a person of their need of God. There might even be no scripture since the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of scripture. I'd have to figure out on my own the origin of life and what to do with my sin and on and on my thoughts continued. Basically, it would be like living without life support, bankrupt, Then abruptly, as if waking from bad dream, or in in this case, a nightmare, I began to focus on the reality of all God provides for me, for you, in fulfilling the promise Jesus made to send His Spirit. My immediate response was overwhelming gratefulness. I wanted to slip out of my chair and fall on my knees to worship this this profound provider of exactly what he knew I would need in the hour of my deepest need. He prays for me and for you that the Father would take care of us, John chapter 17. In John 14, verse 6 through chapter 16, he promised to give us a comforter, a truth guide, an illuminator of scripture, an agent of conviction, someone to be in us and with us, the one who would bring glory to the Lord through me, through you. What would life be without the Spirit? No oil. Our witness would have no effect. No one would listen to us. Our witness would be of no conviction if we had not the Spirit of God. But what if we did not have a church, if we had a church without the Holy Spirit? We can sing songs without the Holy Spirit. They can even excite our emotions. We can recite lines of liturgy. We can talk with others about life without the Holy Spirit. We can prepare sermons without the Holy Spirit. We can listen to those spirit-less sermons without the Holy Spirit. We can offer prayer without the Holy Spirit. We can partake of a thimble of grape juice and a tiny cracker without the Holy Spirit. We can run through our optimized order of service without the Holy Spirit. And as To the second point, the church, the assembly of the Bible was led by the Spirit from the beginning to the end. It depended in the Spirit for everything. 
Without the Holy Spirit, the charismatic gifts would cease to function. There would be no prophetic word possible, no words of knowledge or wisdom, no healing. None of the functions of normal assembly of Christian people filled by the Spirit coming. Coming together to share their individual giftings in a public setting. The order of church would vanish without the Holy Spirit. What would those, uh, those assembled do next? No one would have a psalm or spiritual song to bring because the Holy Spirit would not be there to inspire its singing or bringing. What inspired in the moment message would be possible? Who would lead the people in the church assembly, those equipped by the Spirit, to use their gifts would have nothing to do. Their reliance on the Spirit shattered by His absence. They would sit passively lost. A real church without the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide, equip, use, and mobilize would cease completely to be what it is supposed to be as depicted in the Scriptures. Interestingly, the Holy Spirit often leads us to do certain activities that can be done without Him or apart from Him. So how can we tell the difference? between doing certain activities without the Holy Spirit and doing them with the Holy Spirit. And we need to know the answers to those. That's not my message this morning. But just think, what if we did not have the Spirit, no fire, no oil, no fire? What a mess it would be. And there are many churches today that are dead with people in them. They have no spirit. The spirit has long left. And they still go through the same motions. I know how to craft a sermon. I can sit down and write one. But woe to the pastor that bypasses the prayer room. And doesn't bathe what he's doing in prayer. And get the mind of the Spirit. And pray until he knows this is God's Word. Yesterday as I was praying, I found myself praying this way. Lord, what I see today is not what I saw when I started. It's been watered down and tamed until you're hardly able to move. It's just a function that we perform. Oh God, would you do it again? Would you come again and breathe life into these corpses and cause us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit? We've heard enough sermons in our lifetime to save a world. But unless God's Spirit is working in us, there's not much That can be done. And so without the Spirit, I can't imagine. But I also saw this tag as I was doing some research. Christianity without the Holy Spirit. We are there. And this is what people are saying. That's not what I think. And it's like I told someone about 15, 20 years ago that was here in a new, new, new people's class. And they were telling me that. That's not how I feel about it. I said, it doesn't really matter what you feel or what you think. What really matters is what does this book say? And that's all that really makes a difference. And that was, her husband said later, You couldn't have scripted something better that needed to be said. But today we are doing what is right in our own eyes. We set our schedule. We come when we please, when it's convenient for us. We do as we please rather than getting the mind of the Spirit. And the reason government sets moral atmosphere and standards today is because the church 
is not moving in the power of the Spirit of God to, to, to be a pattern and to model what it means to really have Christ in your life. Very little difference. I'm not going to get on my soapbox. I'm going to keep going. What if the Spirit wasn't here? There would be no fire, no passion. And so that's why I'm speaking today on this. And as we talk about the return, the revelation at His coming, and the response that God desires from what He wrote here, I want you to know that I'm aware Christmas is already in vogue. Black Friday is history, thank God. And some of you look like a deer looking in the headlights. You must have been out for good for Bad Friday or Dark Friday or Black Friday, whatever it is. Because what a mess that is. But let me tell you that we are closer to his return than we are. To his first coming. That's 2,000 years ago or better. And we're closer to the return of the Lord. Jesus is coming back for his bride, the church. And the hour of his coming is uncertain. In Matthew 24, verse 43 and and, uh, 44, it says, But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming... He would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man comes at an hour when you do not expect him. Since we don't know what time the thief is coming, we better call ADT, right? And get a security system in our home so we can be safe. Make our houses burglar proof. So we do everything we can to prevent the thief from taking our goods. And in our neighborhood, in our community, I get emails from them. Make sure your garage door is down because we've had folks who've lost things out of their garage this week. They left the door open. Don't leave your keys in the car. Don't leave them unlocked. And we do all that we can. But I tell you, I I feel sorry For those who are seeking their own way, really? Without the Holy Spirit, really? Who do you think you are? You're writing your own script. I'll find what I think is right, really. I can't believe that. Oh, I think we should know what we believe and why we believe it. We need to find it in the scriptures. If it isn't, chuck it. But we need to make sure that we're depending on God to teach us and to lead us. I've got a sign in my front yard. I want to put it where the thief could see it. This house has security system. But I thought about one that I read somebody put in the front yard. And it said this, there's nothing in this house worth your death to get. And what was that saying? Don't come in here. If you do, there's a reception planned for you. And I, I, I have to amuse because, listen, the enemy, invisible, spirits in high places, and the devil speaking through the lives of others, and we are... We are a match. What rock did you, what planet did you come from? No man is a match for him without God. But everyone with God is more than a match for him. Because our Lord is a victor. And so we make our lives thief proof. So the thief can't come and steal our children. Oh, it makes me, it infuriates me. And I dedicate them. And then I see in later points, many, the enemy comes in and takes over. And I say, my, that's not God's plan. That's not what we're about. 
we were about raising them to know Christ. Consider his coming and live in perpetual preparation for the hour when Jesus returns. There will be no time to prepare when he returns. The Bible says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout of command and the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will, we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Clean up your life in preparation for his coming. He that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he also is pure. 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Last evening, my sister texts me, and said, I found one of our cousins whom I haven't seen for many years. And she gave me the name, and sure enough, I recognize. First cousin, we used to, when I was very small, live right beside of them in Alta Vista, Virginia. And, as, and, and I asked some questions, and my sister wrote back later, well, my, my cousin, who told me at 16 years of age that I've decided I'm not going to serve God, and uh, I always loved him, and he said, what about you? I said, well, I haven't come to that decision, and I didn't, I've never forgotten his words. His oldest daughter, whom Betty and I know well when she was born, dead already. Another's husband is dead. Another's divorced. Another's health is gone. You see, their father left the faith at a crucial time in those kids' lives. And six of them, two of them with alternative lifestyles. And the rest, it's a mess. And I said to Betty, I said, we have so much to thank God for. We had godly parents who set the stage. They didn't let us set it. They set it. And that's exactly who has been delegated and commissioned to set it. The kids don't rule the roost. The prisoners aren't ruling the prison. We're in charge. Hallelujah. Take advantage of it because it won't last long. And it'll be on the, she'll be on the other foot. Peter said, as be obedient. And we believe in him. Be holy. Christ is coming. Secondly, the revelation. Not everyone will be ready when he returns. There will be people unprepared who will not go when the trumpet sounds. Represented by five foolish virgins. They have no oil in their lamps. Different scholars see different things with a light. I think it can mean a lot of things. I believe it, it can be the Word because the Bible says it is a light and a lamp. It can also be uh, the love in our heart, the flame of love fueled by the Holy Spirit. When it diminishes, it usually is from a lack of nourishing and feeding on the Word through prayer. Five did not prepare for His coming. And I was reading the other day, and here's what the writer said. They asked, some, they asked uh, ones that had it, give some of yours. This is something that no man can give you. You must get it for yourself. No one else can do it. No preacher, no church, nothing, no one is able to communicate to you the Spirit. He is the baptizer. He is the giver of the Spirit. And it must be individually. 
Well, you say, I hope that I'm okay. You better do more than hope. You better know that you're okay. When the bridegroom delayed his coming, they became drowsy. They were nodding off. That's what the word means. I didn't know how quickly you can go to sleep until I was driving to Virginia a couple of years ago on a Sunday afternoon after preaching, eating a heavy lunch. I'm sitting in my car. It's warm. I'm comfortable. And I'm going down Interstate 81 toward Bristol, last leg of my journey, when all of a sudden Betty screamed, wake up. And I looked up just in time to see two motorcycles. I could have touched them. The woman with her hand out to stop me because I was moving over into their lane. And I was drifting right into those people. And thank God I was awake. I said, this scares me. One moment I was awake, the next moment drowsiness took over. Boom, I'm sound asleep. I'm sitting there, driving with my eyes closed. It doesn't work. Don't do it. I read this week of a trucker who lost his life. He went to sleep behind the wheel. Are you asleep this morning? Spiritually? What does that mean? Insensitive to the Holy Spirit unaware of what God is saying, not connected to receive what the Lord is sending to you this morning, just in a daze. The thing that amazes me about the five foolish and the five wise, you can't tell the difference. They all had lamps. They all started with oil. And they all became drowsy and slept. But that's how lethargy creeps into a person's life. You are fired up one moment, the next moment, what are you doing? You're not even sharing your faith with anybody. You don't care whether anybody gets sold, you saved, you would never say that. But that's how our lives are lived. It's our family get together. Well, that who do do? I love it when my family comes in. Well, I had two-thirds of them for Thanksgiving. And when they left, I said, praise God. I didn't even hear an unkind word. Hallelujah. No disagreements about anything. Of course, we didn't talk about anything disagreeable. That's not bad, is it? But I'm telling you something. God comes first. Thank both of you. You'll thank me one day, or else you will, I don't know what you might do. The bridegroom delayed, started nodding. Sleep is when a person has no sensitivity to spiritual things. They still look like a believer, bring their Bible to church, sit right beside of somebody that's full of the Holy Spirit. They become dull and are not sensitive to nor responsive to the Word and the Spirit and no apparent difference between the two, the possessors and the professors. They were exactly alike until Jesus came. He taught us in the parable of the tares called the parable of the weeds when those seed come up and the tares grow, they, his servant said, shall we pull them up? He said, no. If you do, you may uproot the wheat. Let them grow. But in the harvest, that's the end of the world, they'll be separated. All weeds will be gathered and cast into the fire. Lots of church people will not go to heaven because church will not save you. Jesus saves. And you, it's good to, you look at, nobody's going to say. A good person is the most difficult to reach because you can't get them lost. A churchgoer is even more difficult. 
Because if anybody would say, hey, let me talk to you about your soul, they'd be upset. Sometimes better to have people upset. Holy Spirit speaks to you, better to let them, let the chips fall. But do what God says to do. Let them grow. I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first. Bind them, cast them into the fire. I want to move on because we're going to end with, a, with communion. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Jude 1 verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. The things of God are foolishness to the natural man. They must be spiritually discerned. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. Those who are prepared have oil. When you have oil, you have fire. Passion, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, responsive to the word of God. The Holy Spirit ignites your faith. Whatever's of flesh is flesh. Whatever's of the Spirit is spirit. Those who have oil are like the apostles after Pentecost. Those without it are like the apostles before Pentecost. It's a, it's a, it's a day that is going to be a wake-up call. The only problem is it's too late. It's too late. The Bible says that they went into the feast and shut the door. That language is destiny oriented. It drips with destiny. That's their destiny. God has warned them time and time again. They refuse to hear. The door is shut. And they bleg and plead and cry out, Master, open the door. And his reply is, I do not know you. And he would not open the door. The day's coming when you can't repent. The day's coming when it's too late. When Christ comes. When Christ comes, I believe we're so close to it, it's not funny. I celebrate his birth with one eye on his second coming. He's coming soon. With joy, we welcome his returning. It may be morning. It may may be night or noon. But we know this. Jesus said, in an hour when you think not, The Son of Man cometh. And what is our response? Verse 13 tells us what we should do. And that is to keep awake. A spiritual alertness. How many times does the Spirit say, wake up? Paul did it in his writings. Wake up, he said. It's later than you think. Wake up. Be alert. Be sober, Peter said. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the enemy, walks about seeking someone to devour. The door was shut for the foolish. The door was shut. Language of settled destiny. They cried out for the door to be open. It's not enough just to be pure. Virgin speak of purity. It's not enough. It's not enough. We're headed that direction down the road of immorality in our world. It's not enough just to be pure. You must believe. And it must be saving faith. Their eternity is sealed. The wise illustrate the vigilant and expectant attitude of faith in respect of which believers are described as they that look for him. Hebrews 9, 28. 
and love his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. It's a vivid parable, a warning. There is such a thing as being too late. That once the door of eternal destiny is closed, it will not be reopened. The story is an admonition to be filled with the Spirit. In our everyday lives, Pastor jo- Johannes from Berlin, Germany, in his blog made these statements. The Holy Spirit causes explosive decisions in us. He starts avalanches in our life. He builds bridges between people, open doors, and makes us one. He's heaven's manager. The Holy Spirit turns ordinary people into extraordinary ones. People filled with the Holy Spirit no longer fit any pattern. They're extravagant. They become personalities. The light of the world. He overshadows you and turns you into something special, something exclusive. He turns the untalented into natural talents and simple workmen into artisans. Speaking of the artist of the tabernacle. In him the weak say, I am strong. Hallelujah. You don't need degrees, he said. You need your heart in the right place. And if the Holy Spirit is sitting on the throne of your heart, that's quite enough. God uses untalented, incapable people to do mighty works. For example, David against Goliath. He had the anointing, and he said, I come in the name of the Lord. He was the son, number eight, not the firstborn, but the Holy Spirit used him. Holy Spirit-filled people are capable of much more than we give them credit for. Holy Spirit-filled people can jump over shadows or walls with our God. Holy Spirit-filled people can go through doors that are still closed today. The Holy Spirit is like air or water, which gets in anywhere and everywhere. He fits into any situation, has a wonderful solution for every problem. He's our helper. If you're in difficulties at times and don't know which way to turn, the Holy Spirit will show you the way out. With Him, I can be sure I'll get out of troubled waters no matter how deep they are. I'm coming out. Amen? I'm going to be a victor and not a victim. I'm going to be standing when everything is over. And so he says, live prepared for his return. Keep the light burning. Keep the oil in your lamp. Have a continual supply of the Spirit. And be ready when the trumpet sounds. The bridegroom cometh. Go out to meet him. We're ready. Ready. Because of the Holy Spirit's work. We're ready. This morning, we take the emblems of his death and resurrection. His death mainly. We show forth the death until he comes. That's what Jesus said. Paul said, I got this from the Lord. You do show forth my death until I return. How does communion show forth the death of Christ? I just, I'm, it takes me years to get it sometimes. But I've been thinking about this for a good while. How could a broken piece of bread that represents a body that is broken? Now, he had no broken bones because the Scripture says not a bone will be broken. But when they thrust the sword into his side, what came out? Blood and water. And I've heard it said, symbolic, 